presentation today on Joe Hill. All right. On the last day of Joe Hill's life, he woke around 5 a.m. He looked about his jail cell and promptly began ripping up his bed sheets and tying the strips between the bars so that the, uh, so that the door could not be opened. He then barricaded himself in by putting his bed against the door. The guards tried to remove the barrier, and he attacked them with the sharp, with the sharp end of a broken bro broomstick he had been given the night before to clean his cell. The guards responded in kind by breaking more broomsticks and stabbing back at him. He managed to wrestle one of the guards' sticks away from them, and so arm himself with two weapons. Joe managed to draw blood from the two guards before the sheriff arrived. The sheriff said, Joe, this is all nonsense. What do you mean, asked Joe. You profess to die like a man, the, sher the sheriff answered. Well, Joe said, I'm through, but you can't blame a man for fighting for his life. Joe was escorted into the, into the prison yard and sat on a chair 20 feet in front of the firing squad concealed behind a, can uh, behind a canvas drape. A doctor located the exact location of Joe's heart with a stethoscope, then pinned a paper heart over it. He was strapped to the chair and the guard stepped away. Joe yelled, I'm going now, boys. Goodbye. Expecting to hear a response from the comrades he had invited to be there at his execution. Unbeknownst to Joe, the warden had not allowed them, to, uh, allowed them onto prison grounds. There was no response. He shouted again, Goodbye, boys. The deputy in charge of the firing squad began the sequence of commands. Ready? Aim? Fire! Go on and fire, Joe yelled before the deputy could finish. He cracked a smile. The firing squad followed Joe's command, and the report of five rifle shots filled the prison yard. The smile faded from Joe's lips. He jerked, sp he jerked spasmodically in his straps, and then hung limp. There were four dark circles in the paper heart pinned to his chest, and soon it was dyed red. It was just before 8 a.m. on November 19, 1915, in Salt Lake City. Some years after, Alfred Hayes would write the following poem. I dreamed I saw Joe Hill last night, alive as you or me. Says I, but Joe, you're ten years dead. I never died, says he. In Salt Lake Joe, says I to him, him standing by my bed. They framed you on a murder charge, says Joe, but I ain't dead. The copper bosses killed you, Joe. They shot you, Joe, says I. Takes more than guns to kill a man, says Joe, I didn't die. And standing there, as big as life, and smiling with his eyes, Joe says what they forgot to kill went on to organize. Joe Hill ain't dead, he says to me. Joe Hill ain't never died. Where working men are out on strike, Joe Hill is at their side. From San Diego up to Maine in every mine and mill, where workers strike and organize, says he, you'll find Joe Hill. I dreamed I saw Joe Hill last night, alive as you or me. Says I, but Joe, you're ten years dead. I never died, says he. Since then, Joe has been memorializing numerous folk songs and legends. He's basically the Johnny Appleseed of the, of the labor movement. As is often the case with folk legends, it is hard to tease out fact from folklore. Fortunately for us, while Joe was in, the, was in the Utah State Prison, a friend wrote to him to request some biographical information. This was Joe's reply. Biography, you say? No, let's not spoil good writing paper with such nonsense. Only the here and now is of concern to me. I'm a citizen of the world, and I was born on a planet called Earth. The, the exact spot where I first saw the light of day is of such slight importance that it deserves no comment. I haven't much to say about myself. We'll say only that I have done what little I could do to bring the flag of freedom closer to its goal. That being said, in 1902, a 23-year-old man named Joel Hagland stepped off a boat from his native Sweden and into New York City. Like so many other immigrants from the old world, he had been lured to America with promises of opportunity and prosperity. What he found instead can probably best be summed up, summed up by an Italian immigrant who, uh, to America who said, it was an old superstition, sometimes half believed by the sim simplest immigrants, that the streets of New York were paved with gold. When they got here, they learned three things. First, that the streets were not paved with gold. Second, that the streets were not paved at all. And third, that they were expected to pave them. <laughs> Joel soon changed his name to Joseph Hillstrom and began his life as an itinerant worker. His fellow workers would, uh, would later change his name, uh, shorten it down to Hill for him. Hopping freight trains around the United States in search of work. In 1905, he wrote home uh, with a Christmas card postmarked in Cleveland, Ohio. Joel had been raised in a devoutly religious and apolitical family, but his love for music was fostered from a very young age. He would later become a prolific songwriter. His experience as an itinerant worker, known pejoratively as a hobo, informed many of his song lyrics. 
notably in his song, The Tramp. And this is the lyrics of that song. If you all will shut your trap, I will tell you about a chap that was broke up and a gun <laughs> up against it two for fair. He was not the kind of shirk, he was looking hard for work, but he heard the same old story everywhere. Tramp, 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 keep on a trampin'. Nothing doing here for you. If I catch you around again, you will wear the ball and chain. So just keep on trampin', that's the best thing you can do. He walked up and down the street till the shoes fell off his feet. In a house, he spied a lady cooking stew. And he said, how do you do? May I chop some wood for you? What the lady told him made him feel so blue. She said, tramp, 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 keep on a trampin'. Nothing doing here for you. If I catch you round again, you were well, you were well, uh, you were well, uh, you will wear the ball and chain. So just keep on trampin'. That's the best thing you can do. Across the street, a sign he read, work for Jesus, so it said. And he said, here's my chance, I'll surely try. He kneeled upon the floor till his knees got rather sore. But at eating time, he heard the preacher cry. Tramp, 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 keep on a trampin'. Nothing doing here for you. If I catch you round again, you will, you will wear the ball and chain. So just keep on tramping, that's the best thing you can do. Finally came that happy day when his life did pass away. He was sure he'd go to heaven when he died. When he reached the pearly gate, Santa Peter, mean old skate, slammed the gate right in his face and loudly cried. Tramp, 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 keep on a trampin'. Nothing doing here for you. If I catch you round again, you will, well, you will wear them off ball and chain. So just keep on tramping. That's the best thing you can do. So in despair he went to hell with the, with the devil for to dwell. For the reason he'd, not, he'd no other place to go. And he said, I'm full of sin, so for Christ's sake let me in. But the devil said, oh beat it, you're a bow. In 1906, uh, Joe was in San Francisco and experienced one of the greatest natural disasters in the history of the United States. When a 7.9 earthquake struck the Bay Area and resulted in a fire, uh, all, of which, uh, all of which cost, uh, cost about 3,000 lives. Joe wrote to his hometown newspaper with his experience of the event. <clears throat> this is uh, an excerpt from my letter. I saw many moving and heart-rending scenes. Half-naked women carrying small children were driven from their homes. Some refused to leave their homes and were seized and bound to keep them from going back into the flames. So-called martial law was proclaimed immediately. That means momentary death for the least criminal act or disobe disobedience. Two soldiers came and gave me an axe and put a large steel hat on me. And before I knew what it, uh, what it was all about, I was employed as a fireman in the San Francisco Fire Department. I worked for 36 hours without food or drink before I was released. My work consisted of helping old people uh, from the fire, carrying out the sick from the hospitals, saving valuables, etc. The officer who released me first wrote down my name. Then he looked into my pockets for loot. If he had found any, I would have received an extra buttonhole in the vest for all my work and would probably have never written this letter. The fire was not out everywhere, and the formerly rich San Francisco is now a smoking ruin. About a hundred frame houses are all that is left of the proud queen on the shores of the Pacific Ocean. In 1909, reports of an individual who identified himself only as Mexico um, claimed that Joe was instrumental in organizing a sabotage campaign against a motor shop. A new foreman had been hired at the motor shop, who then lowered wages for the, of the workers by about 20%. The workers protested and threatened a strike, but the foreman responded in, uh, by bringing in hired strike breakers. Reportedly, Joe had heard about their situation and stepped in to help them organize a, uh, co uh, and covertly sabotage the machines. The campaign succeeded in bringing production to a halt and, forces the and forcing the bosses to negotiate with the workers. In 1910, in San Pedro, California, uh, Joe joined the Industrial Workers of the World. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with the IWW, they were a radical labor union who sought to bring all workers together under one train union in order to overthrow capitalism. Members of the IWW are referred to as Wobblies. They were a radical alternative to the American Federation of Labor. The 1905 preamble to the IWW Constitution reads, the working class and the employing class have nothing in common. There can be no peace so long as hunger and want are found among millions of working people, and the few who make up the employing class have all the good things in life. Between these two classes, a struggle must, must go on until the workers of the world organize it as a class, take possession of the earth and the machinery of production, and abolish the wage, wage system. We find that, center, that the centering of management of industries into fewer and fewer hands makes the trade unions unable to cope with the ever-growing power of the employing class. 
the trade unions foster a state of affairs which allows one set of workers to be, to be pitted against another set of workers in the same industry, thereby helping defeat one another in wage wars. Moreover, the trade union uh, unions aid in, in the employing class to mislead the workers into the belief that the working class have interests in common with their employers. <clears throat> Joe rose in prominence uh, in the IWW as a songwriter. The IWW had adopted a policy of using music as an effective tactic in spreading their message to the public. This was in part due to the fact that oftentimes, when an IWW representative was speaking on the street, the Salvation Army band would come by and attempt to drown them out with the sound of church hymns. The IWW, instead of trying to yell over them, came up with the idea of writing new lyrics to the church hymns and singing, and singing using the Salvation Army band as, an, as accompaniment. Joe Hill was a master of the hymn parody. <clears throat> Though Joe denies involvement, it is fairly certain that he was among wobblies, that uh, with Mexican anarchists Ricardo Flores Magana, I'm probably mispronouncing that, and Enrique and his brother Enrique Flores uh, Magana, in the 1911 Maganista Revolt, established several, which established several short-lived revolutionary communes in Baja, Mexico. Joe Hill was reportedly in charge of enlisting wobblies in Los, An in Los Angeles into the rebel army. The force was eventually overwhelmed by the Mexican army, and they retreated back into the U.S. Another notable event occurred in 1911, the Harriman and Illinois Central Railroad System shop shopman strike. Throughout the Harriman system, nine craft unions united into a, si into a system federation. All nine of these unions presented this, uh, the same 16 demands to the Harriman system companies. Core among their demands was to be recognized as a single collective bargaining agent. Railroad management rejected the 16 demands and would only bargain with the separate unions one at a time. The IWW saw the unification of the unions as an important, steps, an important step towards building the one big union, and hence they provided support for the Federation. The company's response to the promise of a strike by the Federation was to lay off many union workers and hire non-union men to take their place. The union workers were understandably pissed, and the strike began immediately. 300 men in San Pedro and 1,400 in Los Angeles walked off their jobs on the same day. The trains, however, kept moving, partially due to non-union workers remaining at their posts, but even more so due to union engineers, firemen, and brakemen who refused to strike. The strike would eventually be defeated because of these individuals. The San Francisco local of the IWW issued a sticker in response that said, Railroad men, no scab so despicable as a union scab. Tie up the road, use IWW tactics. Solidarity wins. Joe Hill wrote, a, uh, wrote the song Casey Jones, the Union Scab, in solidarity with the strikers. It goes, the, un uh, the workers on the SB line to strike sent out a call, but Casey Jones, the engineer, he wouldn't strike at all. His boiler, it was leaking, and the drivers on the bum, and his engine and its bearings, they were all out of plumb. Casey Jones kept his junk pile running. Casey Jones was working double time. Casey Jones got a wooden medal for being good and faithful on the SP line. The workers said to Casey, won't you help us win this strike? But Casey said, let me alone, you better take a hike. Then someone put a bunch of railroad ties across the, across the track, and Casey hit the river bottom with an awful crack. Casey Jones hit the river bottom. Casey Jones broke his blooming spine. Casey Jones was an Angelino. He took a trip to heaven on the SP line. When Casey got up to Evan, way up to the pearly gates, he said, I'm Casey Jones, the guy that pulled the SP freight. You're just the man, said Peter. Our, our musicians went on strike. You can get a job at a scabbing any time you like. Casey Jones got a job in heaven. Casey Jones was doing mighty fine. Casey Jones went scabbing on the angels, just like he did to workers on the SP line. The angels got together and they said it wasn't fair for Casey Jones to go around a scabbing everywhere. The angels union number 23, they sure, they sure were there, and they promptly fired Casey down the golden stairs. Casey Jones went to hell a-flying. Casey Jones, the devil said, oh fine. Casey Jones get busy shoveling sulfur. That's what you get for scabbing on the SP line. Not much is known of Joe Hill's activities from this point until about 1914. What is known that he is that he left San Pedro in the summer of 1913 to Los Angeles, and from there he departed with, uh, with the intended destination of Mexico, uh, Chicago. He stopped in Salt Lake City to earn some money for the rest of his trip. He found work in Park City, which uh, at the time was just a small mining town. Uh, but Joe became ill while working in Park City and had to be hospitalized for two weeks, which resulted in him losing his job. 
Uh, Joe and a friend named Otto Applequist became guests of the uh, Asilius brothers, who lived in Murray, Utah. On January 10, 1914, Joe left the Asilius' home sometime between 6 and 9 p.m. and did not return until around 1 a.m. Around 11.30, he arrived at the home of Dr. Frank McHugh. Joe was wounded and carrying a pistol. pistol. He explained to Dr. McHugh that he had been involved in a fight with a man who claimed uh, he had insulted his wife, and the man shot Joe beneath his armpit, leaving an exit wound in his back. Joe explained that he had then wrestled the gun out of the man's hands and claimed it for himself as a souvenir. Joe refused to divulge the name of uh, the man or woman, the, lo uh, the man or the woman, or the location where this event took place. Dr. McHugh tre treated Joe, and an associate of Dr. McHugh's drove Joe back to the Asilius residence. Along the way, Dr. Bird witnessed Joe throw his gun into the gutter. Meanwhile, around 10 p.m. of the same night, John G. Morrison and his two sons were closing a grocery store when two men wearing red bandanas entered the store, yelled, we've got you now, and shot John Morrison, who was lifting a sack of potatoes uh, behind the counter. They also shot and killed Ar uh, Arlie Morrison, his son. Several witnesses reported seeing two assailants fleeing the store. One ran awkwardly and held his chest as if he had been wo wounded. A theory spurned on by the presence of blood trails found near the crime scene. John Morrison succumbed to his wounds shortly thereafter at the police station hospital. The police made a thorough search of the surrounding area and procured four suspects. Two of them were uh, men apprehended while trying to board a freight train. The policemen reportedly had to empty their guns to apprehend them. The two suspects turned out to be wanted in Arizona for a uh, $300 robbery. They were not, however, held as suspects in the Morrison case. Another man was found walking near the Morrison uh, grocery soon after the shootings with a bloody handkerchief in his pocket. The man claimed he was innocent, the police believe, believed him, and he was sent on his way. Though, uh, he, though he reported he was staying at the Salvation Army house, which turned out not to be true. A 19-year-old boy was also under suspicion when he walked into the police station that night with a 38 caliber bullet wound in his arm. He was questioned and then released. The assumed motive for the murder was revenge, since no attempt at robbery was made, and the assailant said only, we've got you now, fired, and fled the scene. John G. Morrison had worked for many years as a police officer and often feared that, <clears throat> that many he had put into jail would one day seek revenge on him. <clears throat> he had, in fact, been attacked twice before at his grocery store, and both times he returned gunfire with gunfire and lived. The first attempt, result, attempt resulted in the death of one of the assailants, and the second, he wounded one of the assailants who then fled the scene on a bicycle. Many believe that the third and final attack was one of the assailants come to finish the job. Several witnesses reported seeing a suspicious looking man in the area of the murder that same night. That man turned out to be a convict by the name of Frank Z. Wilson, <clears throat> who then became the primary suspect in the robberies. <clears throat> that is, until uh, Dr. McHugh's associate, Dr. Bird, relayed the story of Joe Hill's mysterious wound to the authorities. Three or four days after the shooting, the police arrived at the Asilius residence to apprehend Joe. The, the Asilius family showed the police to Joe's room where he lay in a severely weakened state due to his gunshot wound. When the police entered the room, Joe reached for a handkerchief and was promptly shot in the hand by one of the officers. The bullet shattered Joe's knuckles, and Joe, uh, and Joe was taken to the Salt Lake County Jail in such a weakened state that he could not even speak. The, author, uh, the officer who shot Joe Hill failed to report that, that he had actually done that, and so the authorities, uh, the other policemen, spent their time trying to come up with theories as to when he got shot, and they traced it to the blood trails that were left at the crime scene. And then he later came out and said, oh, I shot him because he was reaching for a gun. But then later investigations showed that he didn't, that Joe didn't even have a gun in the room with him. <clears throat> at first, the police uh, reported that Joe Hill was actually their initial suspect, Frank Z. Wilson. But after the police learned of Joe Hill's true identity, the songbird of the IWW, their tone changed, and they ecstatically reported that they had apprehended uh, apprehended Joe Hill, who was certainly the man who committed the, the Morrison murders. The, po uh, the policy, well, the police uh, then sought uh, out Otto Applequist, Joe's friend, as the suspected accomplice in the crimes. Otto, however, had gotten the hell out of Dodge, and his whereabouts never became known. On January 27, 1914, Hill entered a plea of not guilty. The majority of the evidence against Hill was circumstantial, though his refusal to give specific details as to the origin of his gunshot wound and his association with the IWW were not super helpful. 
the IWW would some subsequently try to paint Joe's trial as a frame-up in order to execute one of, the, one of their prominent members. This is, of course, an oversimplification. But Utah was and had been a hotbed of militant organized labor. <clears throat> the Western Federation of Miners had called strikes in, U in Utah, uh, some of which had even resulted in pitched battles between labor and strike breakers. The atmosphere during Joe's trial was tense. To Joe's credit, he tried to keep the IWW out of the discussion of the trial, but it was continually, continually dragged to the forefront. In an article to the socialist newspaper Appeal to Reason, Hill wrote, Owing to the prominence of Mr. Morrison, there had to be a scapegoat, and the undersigned being, as they thought, uh, a friendless tramp, a Swede, and worst of all, an IWW, had no right to live anyway, and was therefore duly selected to be the scapegoat. After appeals and an outpouring of support from Helen Keller and even President Woodrow Wilson to not have Joe, Joe Hill executed, Joe was eventually sentenced to be executed by a firing squad. Prior to his execution, Joe wrote to, uh, to founding member of the IWW, Big Bill, Bill Haywood, who incidentally is also from Utah. Well, he's from Utah. Goodbye, Bill. I die like a true rebel. Don't waste time mourning. Organize. And there was also a, P, a PS to this message, which I'm sure some people here will appreciate. It is 100 miles from here to Wyoming. Could you arrange to have my body hauled to the state line to be buried? I don't want to be caught dead in Utah. <laughs> Bill wrote back, Goodbye, Joe. You will live long in the hearts of the working class. Your songs will be sung wherever the workers toil, urging them to organize. At 10 p.m. the night before Joe's execution, Joe passed his last will through the bars of, uh, of his cell to a guard. It read, my, uh, my will is easy to decide, for it is that there is nothing to divide. My kin don't need to fuss and moan. Moss does not cling to a rolling stone. My body, oh, if I could choose, I would to ashes it reduce. And let the merry breezes blow my dust to where some flowers grow. Perhaps some, fla some, uh, some fading flower then would come to life and bloom again. This is my last, last and final will. Good luck to all of you. <clears throat> That's basically it. I, I um, kind of wanted us to sing a song at the end of this. Who wants to sing a song? Yeah. Everybody raise your hand. Everyone <laughs> wants to sing a song. <laughs> okay. like one volunteer. <laughs> um, okay, this is a call and response song, right? So we're going to do this a cappella. So basically the chorus goes like this. You will eat by and by. And then right after that you guys say by and by, right? Okay, so you will eat by and by okay. in that glorious land above the sky. And then you guys say, way up high, way up high. Okay. Uh, Work and pray, live on hay, you'll get a spot. A, a pie in the sky when you die. And then you say, that's a lie. That's a that's lie. lie. That's a lie. Okay, so let's do a practice one. You will eat by and by in that glorious land above the sky. <laughs> Work and pray, live on hay, you'll get a pie in the sky when you die. That's, That's a lie. lie. Thank you. All right. Let's do this thing. All right. Long-haired preachers come out every night, try to tell you what's wrong and what's right. But when asked how about something to eat, well, they will answer in voices so sweet. You will eat by and by in that glorious land above the sky. Way up high. Work and pray, live on hay. You'll get a pie in the sky when you die. That's, That's a lie. lie. And the starvation army they play. And they sing and they clap and they pray. Till they get all your coin on the drum. Then they'll tell you when you're on the bum. You will eat by and by. In that glorious <laughs> land above the sky, where well, I can pray, live on hay, you'll get a pie in the sky that's when you die. That's a lie! Working men of all countries unite, side by side we for freedom will fight. When the world and its wealth we have gained, to the grafters we'll sing this refrain. And the last verse is different, so I didn't know. <laughs> you will eat by and by when you've learned how to cook and how to fry. Chop some wood, it'll do you good, and you'll eat in the sweet by and by. That's, That's, all, right. Right. That's all right. Thank you.
discussion of Joe Hill? Well, just a quick comment. I read, well, I didn't quite finish it, but about three-fourths of a biography of Joe Hill about a month ago. And uh, there was, for a long time, kind of this conspiracy that the Mormon Church had him executed. Or there's some conspiracy amongst leaders of the Mormon Church to have him executed. And so a lot of people that were advocating for Joe Hill, IWWs, etc., they were kind of promoting that idea. And uh, it's just not true. Like, the judge was not a Mormon. Most people on the uh, jury that um, convicted him, they weren't Mormon. The prosecutors weren't Mormon. So that kind of flew around for a long time that, you know, it was the Mormon church that killed him, but it's just not accurate. So I don't know if you had read Great. anything about that. But. I would just point out, um, Walter Benjamin sees some of the philosophy of history, it basically makes a strong claim that we should always keep in mind. It's, uh, we don't make revolutionary struggles on the sort of notion that we're going to have a really good future. It's to preserve the memory of our ancestors, such as Joe Hill, as revolutionary comrades. And if we fail to do that, then people like Joe Hill get lost in the tides of history, mm -hmm. and they get forgotten, and their struggles were ultimately for nothing. So. Yeah, and to, just to add on to that, I was going to end with a quote from Che Guevara that says, <clears throat> I don't care if I fall as long as someone else picks up my gun and keeps on shooting. I think that's why it's important to remember people like Joe Hill, people like Che Guevara. Okay. Any other concluding thoughts?